everybody. Welcome to the Truth Will Set You Free show, brought to you by TLB TV and the Liberty Beacon Project. I got to tell you guys, I'm the host, Linda Diane Watley, but I am just so excited today. I am so thankful for the guest that we have today. His name is William Sumner. First of all, William, we love our veterans. Thank you. Absolutely, and thank you for your service and, and for the vets that are out there listening and the families that have loved and supported them. Uh, it is my honor to serve. Thank you very much. Blessing to you too. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm excited because I have to just jump out there and say, because I read his book. We, I just jumped out there, that's why I'm excited, but I'm gonna calm myself down. <laughs> And we are going to hear some great information that's soulful, that's mental, and spiritual. He served in the military as an infantry person, a ranger in special operations at home and abroad. He also was a graduate from West Point. He is an internationally sought out motivational speaker. He is also a person who created a program called Inevitable You. Inevitable You. He's talking you. to all of us. Any human being, you are an inevitable you. He wrote a book that we will be talking about as we proceed forward called Inevitable You, Live Life by Design. How you doing? I'm so happy to be here. You're so alive and bubbly. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I, if there's anything I can do to serve our vets and to serve our friends out there, I'm, uh, I'm honored to do so. Thank you. And it's just, you know, I have to tell people that I am a person that thrives on truth. And when it comes into my life, it just affects me immediately. William is a person that lives by truth. He served our country and he never stopped serving. He can't stop. I can't even believe I was able to pull this time with him. He gave up a football game because he cared about you. And one of the things that we wanted to talk about today is PTSD. And when I was studying some of the things that he felt about PTSD, I saw that people had a difficult time receiving it, but some people did receive it because the truth has a way of causing you to consider facts. And a lot of times people like quick fixes. A lot of times people don't like truth because it's not dynamic. It's life changing. And what he has to say about PTSD, we need to hear. William? Tell us about PTSD and what you have learned when you deal with our government. So Linda, again, thanks for having me. Um, I, I can't emphasize this enough. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is a label. Now, for some people, it works. For some people, they heal from it. But we know a lot of people don't. And we know a lot of people want to, we know a lot of people care. It's incumbent upon us as service providers to try and find that missing link. And I would submit to you that the missing link to healing, to creating, to uplifting, to add value to a lot of people lies, first of all, in the beginning when we label people with a disorder. A disorder by its nature means there's something wrong, there's a deficit, and even General Mattis, uh, the Marine Corps General, now our, our Secretary of Defense, has said, don't label these women and men post-traumatic stress disorder, label them post-traumatic stress growth. I do not, in my personal practice, use PTSD, I use PTSG, because I want to focus on the growth. What have you learned? What strength have you gained? How does this traumatic fragment, memory, thought, emotion, 
How does it serve you? When you change the label and when you begin to look at this thing differently, lots of different things begin to appear. For instance, like if you have a person, because I've always wondered, okay, by nature, we're not killers. So how do you process that through a soldier with PTSD who keep having flashes of killing? So Linda, when, when we call a soldier a killer, again, these are labels and it's really important. You're not bad or wrong when you begin to label. In fact, it's a very normal neural process because if we can funnel experiences into patterns that we can recognize, it speeds up the processing, it speeds up our response time, and in combat or in other times, it's helpful to want to shortcut through pattern recognition to determine what my response should be. Now, in a peacetime environment, when we label the actions as a killer, it is equally valid to label them as defenders of freedom, as saviors of freedom, as you know, uplifters of the downtrodden. There's a whole host of positive things that we can label. So it's not that the power of the label is bad, it's what's the power of the label that you choose. So whether it's a veteran in a combat memory, whether it's a woman in a sexual trauma memory, whether it's a child in a parental trauma or a, a community neighbor trauma memory, we wanna be very thoughtful very careful because what we label the pattern recognition that we give to this experience is going to begin to drive the neural process as to what it means when we shift that beginning the very first step into that memory everything changes wow so why do you think people have a difficult time with your solution to ptsd you know linda uh i've and you have dealt with the federal government and have dealt with, with big pharmaceutical, and, and I'm not a conspiracy, conspiracy theory. I don't think pharmaceutical companies are evil per se. They're bureauc bureaucracies that are driven for profit motives. So they do things very carefully. They're very massive. They have billions of dollars in this. Uh, in your intro, uh, the listeners should know I'm also, in addition to having my military background, in the early 90s, I went and got my master's in social work after I got out of the service. So I'm a social worker too, so not only do I have the military side, you know, as, as you have expressed the requirement and the need to be a killer, but as a social worker, I, I have to love them all too. So this really interesting dichotomy appears, and in the professional world of a social worker, that is mostly driven by a book we call the DSM-5. I'm not sure if you're familiar. I would imagine you're familiar with the DSM-5. That's the Bible for both the medical industry, the insurance industry. It's called the mental health, but there's not one code, not one code that's in that book, and it's, it's that thick, about mental health. It's all mental dishealth disease, disorders, things that are wrong with people. It's how you pose the problem. It's what leads to you beginning to solve something. So pharmaceutical companies funded the DSM-5 revisions, which are now, I think, probably two and a half years ago. And I even, through my West Point connections, managed to get an appointment with a four-star right after the manual came out. And here's Here's the classic argument, and, and again, I'm not a fan of how we've become so polarized on issues that I'm all right, you're all wrong, this is all this, it's none of that. That's not true. There's, there's compromise, there's middle ground, there's a place to have discussions. So I walk into this four-star, and I'm starting to talk about the DSM-5 and how it's reclassified PTSD that's listed in the DSM-5. I said to him, General, do you realize that in the civilian population, 
they estimate almost 60% of civilians will qualify for PTSD diagnoses. They haven't even estimated the military, but it's got to be in the high 90s. He turned and he had brought an admiral who was the chief of psychiatric medicine for the facility that we were at. He turned to him and said, Admiral, is this true? And the admiral was like, absolutely, and it's a good thing because we want our soldiers to have better access to mental health. But there's two unattended consequences of that. First of all, as you well know, soldiers will not go for a PTSD help because once they get put in the system after sequestration, the only place that money exists is in the VA. So we force these soldiers out of the service. So either they're ready to get out, they're forced to get out, or when they want to get out, we can go to a PTSD diagnosis, be forced into the VA to get our treatment. And these men and women, they're not healed. They're not made better while they're on active duty. They go into a mental health post-service treatment program, which is not what the DSM-5 was ever intended to do. It's how it's been implemented by the military branches. So what do you think needs to happen for that soldier that hasn't been diagnosed? When do you think they could actually catch it? Well, first of all, I wouldn't diagnose them, at least certainly a vast majority of them, I wouldn't diagnose them with PTSD, but I'm, I'm operating in a world that I'm not in charge of. I would, like General Mattis has said, we need, and in fact, again, this is the big debate in the mental health industry. There's even a middle ground, and we call it post-traumatic stress injury. Because what do you think of, Linda, when you hear the term injury? An injury, a wound. A and what's going to happen to it? If it's left untended, it's going to get worse. But, but we tend are injured. What, what happens to the bulk of our, our injuries? They get better. When you've been diagnosed with PTSD, when do you get better? That's a good question. The system doesn't really carry that as a high level of truth. It carries a label. It, it, it carries, you know, a, a, a bad label about that. There's something wrong with you. And I have a tool. So I'm a neuroscientist. So ultimately, after West Point, after military, after my master's in social work, I finished off with qualifications in neural psychology. So at my root core, I really work, and the system I built is neural programming. How do we re rewire at the neuronic level to, to change a memory, to change a thought, to change a feeling? So in this world where these young women and young men get these labels and they don't, they don't really get better, they they get better with the label. I want you to ponder this as a metaphor and then we'll come back and apply it to PTSD. When you have a toxic level of anger, even in the civilian world, they send you off to anger management. Now, on a good day, bad day perspective in anger management, on a really bad day, you have a lot of anger, but on your really, really good day, you don't have peace. What you have is well-managed anger. So on your very best day, if you get that to zero, you could say, I'm not angry, but I'm not angry is not the same thing as I'm at peace. So when you come to my coaching system with an anger problem, I send you to serenity management content and information. Serenity management on a really, really good day, you're serene. On a really, really bad day, you have poor serenity. Now what you've really done, Linda, you've set up a structure to look at the problem differently. And let me ask you, comparing these two approaches, on your very best day, you have well-managed anger. We'll, we'll even stack the deck against us. 
on a very bad day, you have poor managed serenity. Which would you rather have? Poor managed serenity. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. Wow. Best day to worst day. You win with the structure. So we don't want to label the vast majority of these soldiers, these, these men and women, as disordered. We want to label them at worst as injured so we can heal them. And at best, I want to focus on the growth that they experience. Can I give you another tool to help you understand how my coaching system works? Yes. So all these tools have, uh, you know, country names, fun names, common sense name, because one, I want people to understand them. And two, I need people to be able to teach the tool if they're watching this video. So I have a tool called Broken Leg Limpers. And I show a internet photograph of a really horribly broken femur. It's like at 90 degree angles. I said, now it's a metaphor, it's not really my leg. But if I was skiing in the mountains and I broke my leg, and I got back down and the ski patrol and the nurse in the ER like, oh my God, that's a terrible leg. Doctor comes in because she says, the nurse says, one of the best orthopods are on duty today. He walks in. He goes, oh, that's really a terrible leg. But I have good news for you. I'm a badass. I'll fix it. <laughs> you, you're going to walk. But I, I need you to understand something. 90% of my patients with that kind of leg injury are going to limp. Now, this is a metaphor, but this is rooted in studies. Like if somebody wants to argue the studies, when we study 90% of his patients, what do 90% of them do? They limp. Wow. Now, parallel universe, different day, same leg break, same evac, same nurse, oh my God, that's one of the worst I've ever seen. Same sentence, one of the best. Now a different doctor walks in. She looks at my leg, says the same thing. It's the worst leg break I've ever seen. But I have good news for you. I'm a badass, I'm gonna fix it. You're gonna walk, that's better. Here's the great news, you have to know the rehab. I do cutting edge rehab. If you do my rehab, 90% of my patients walk fine. When we study her patients, what do they do? They walk. They walk fine. Now here's the two big lessons why this is going to apply today to PTSG. Number one, when someone limps into my office and I say, hey, I notice you're limping. Why do you limp? What do they always tell me? <laughs> I can't help it. Yeah, I had this horrible accident. It's one of the worst they've ever... They don't say, hey, it was a parallel universe day and I got screwed by the wrong medical authority. They believe what they've been told. But here's the even greater news, and this is why it's PTSD. When your body looks at the injury, and I do this with medical audiences. I have so much fun with this. Even medical audiences don't ponder this answer. When your body looks at the injury and goes, oh my God, that's one of the, that's terrible work. Well, autonomic nervous system, full immune, we're, we're going into the maximum healing mode. Do you think the body attempts to return that leg to 100% good as new? Yes or no? I agree. I think it do. Everybody says that. It does not. Because you know what the body knows? The original leg wasn't good enough. It overbuilds it. It makes it better than new. When we studied the two femurs in, in a post-autopsy, post-mortem phase, which is the stronger leg, the broken or the unbroken one? Don't tell me the broken one. Yeah, it has more calcium. It has more reinforcements. It is a stronger bone. If you don't, think about it this way. If we're, we're in the gym, we're doing our big curls, nine, tenth one, tenth one, if we're doing good form, perfect weight, barely get it up. At the cellular level, what's happening to the bicep? It's, it's growing. Cells are violently bursting and dying. That's what causes lactic acid. That's cellular material 
leaching and literally burning. That's an acid that's released because that cell, the weakest cell there is bursting violently and dying. And the body goes, you know what? Those cells were not strong and big enough. We need to, we're going to spend some precious resources and we're going to make the next, the daughter cells a little bigger, a little stronger. That's how you grow. That's the natural order of this energy system. We grow from stress. In fact, if you really look at the word, now we're going to add another tool to post-traumatic stress. When you look at stress, and everybody uses it as one word, I'm stressed out, it's stress. There's technically two forms of it. Eustress, which is E-U, that's the Greek letters for positive, you stress is actually the 10th rep. It's you're not damaging things. You're building things. You're stressing the muscle to create growth. Distress is the second form. That's toxic. I tore my bicep. I, I injured myself. We can injure the mind. It can be distressed. But of all the PTSD that's out there, post-traumatic stress, Already, if we look at it different, there's a great proportion of them that we can take at the stress paradigm, at the stress where we say injury is taking place, we can turn that to use stress and turn it to growth if we focus and think about it that way, label it that way and teach our soldiers, teach our populations, hey, do you have post-traumatic stress disorder? Do you have post-traumatic stress growth? Now, do you think the pharmaceutical companies wants this movement to have a big uplift and take off? No. They do not. Again, they're uh, not evil. They're just focused on their own agenda. They heal people through drugs and medicine. We heal people through their mind. Because, you know, I wrote a book, too, about PTSD because my son served two terms in Iraq. And at the age of five, he was turning five, his father was killed in a car accident a week before their birthday, and they shared the same birthday. And I saw my son, and I knew he was different after that experience. And then he went on, he grew up, and he served two terms in Iraq. He went a good while without diagnosis, but I recognized it because I had it. And because I was able to love him, understand him and relate to him, he trusted me. So trust played a huge part in his coping. He trusted yeah. me enough to give me a chance to save him from time to time. Yes. So would you say that plays a big part in the processing of PTSD? Absolutely. Uh, and I, again, I, I don't want people to think I'm down on mental health professionals. By and large, they are loving, caring, want the best for you. You just have to ask the question, are they using older technology, older techniques, or are they current with the very latest on what we know in neuroscientists. As I like to, you know, not ha-ha joke, but kind of ironically joke, I actually looked this up, it's anecdotal, but 40 years after the Civil War was over, I found the last documented case where a doctor nurse team put leeches on fingers to suck out evil vapors. Now that doctor nurse team weren't evil or stupid, that's what they learned in medical school. They're one of the last holdovers. 40 years previous, we had learned the number one thing that we can do in the medical profession to save lives is to use soap. They were using leeches to suck out evil vapors. They didn't believe in soap. There's always evolving medical technology. And again, to the extent that you know, I argue a lot with psychiatric personnel, with professional psychologists on radio and TV here in Denver. You know, 
While that's going on, again, I want to be very tender. I want to be very loving. I want to be very respectful of the men and women that are doing the best they can with the tools they've got. I just would challenge you to think and really reflect, do I have the latest and most current tools? We know more about how the mind heals. Trust and love is a big component of it, absolutely. And helping your son understand. And again, Lindy, here's what I would know about your son because of just of the few little facts that you gave me. Yes, he, he suffered trauma when he lost his father. Yes, there was a hole, a void perhaps, that on dark days would chase him. But we also know that he developed a great level of independence. He probably developed a great deal, more than average self-reliance, which would be enormously great traits in a military unit to bring that in. And so on his good days, he'd be post-traumatic stress strong. He, his yeah. brain would be stronger. On his bad days, yeah, he missed his father. He, uh, you know, I, I suffered here and there, etc. I'm not diminishing or pretending that doesn't take place. I'm just trying to get people to ask the question, well, what's the latest rehab? How do I look at my injury, which has been told to me by my best orthopod of the day, that I'm going to be a limper? Hmm. That, that doctor loved me. That doctor cared about me. He, and he was right. I'm a limper. No, no. He, he was old. He was in an, a different technology. The question becomes now, again, we're in a medical and it's a metaphor and all that. I understand that. If traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, et cetera, drugs are not working for you, in the neurosciences, there's a whole lot easier and more efficient ways to make this work. Without medication. Without medication. And that's a key factor. Because I had this friend, he had went to Vietnam, he was in the Navy. And he kept having this reoccurring dream where he was being killed. And it just kept happening. Then one night while in his dream state, he looked at it and he said, no, that was then, this is now. You're not doing that to me now because I'm not there. He spoke to it in his sleep and it, it disappeared. Now what you're talking about, Linda, if you've studied the phenomena, it's a little more on the new age spectrum, which not everybody believes in. So take new age out and call it Eastern or more Asian. That's called lucid dreaming. You can learn. They teach you can learn, you can look it up. The internet, oh my goodness, you can get an MIT degree. Everything but the sheepskin. MIT has a four year engineering degree for free on the internet if you wanna work through the courses. There's so much information out there. The problem is, how do I as a lay person know how to sort things out? Well, first of all, if it's not common sense, you need to look at it three times as hard. I've worked very hard to make my stuff common sense. It's hard to argue about some of the things that I tell people other than you want to bluff and bluster and say, well, that's BS and there's no studies to back that up. That's fake news. Yeah, no, it's not. There, there are studies to back this up. There, there is cutting edge information available. If it's not working for you, if traditional therapies are working, Keep at them. Just don't let them convince you you are a, a mental or an emotional limper because they didn't give you the right rehab to help you understand it's your greatest strength. Well, and you know, like for myself, I was, I went a long time undiagnosed from childhood. I was undiagnosed with PTSD. And one of the things that I had started to learn was that, hmm, hmm, you know, I, I started seeing myself and watching myself. I mean, the best thing you can do is observe yourself. And one of the things that I came up, correct me if, if you agree with this, that 
to me, I have learned that PTSD is just a normal survival reaction to life's traumas. It's not out of the norm. It's Correct. The norm. And what human have you ever met, Linda, that at some point in their life is not traumatized? Be it, you know, they could happen as, as, a, as a small child, your, your, your parent is, or your absent parent is, or, you know, you're, you're in high school and, and a neighbor does something, or you, you go to college, you have a great childhood through, through high school, you go to college and, and someone dies at a, at a frat or a sorority party or a DUI, or, or you make it through college and, and your first job, you get fired or you're something, you know, you lose your house or your, your marriage goes or your, your child gets a deathly ill. It's who makes it through their time here without having some mental, emotional, broken leg. And it's the worst, if for you, it's the worst you've ever seen. Yes. I, I, I respect and honor that. Just slow down a bit when someone convinces you that's a professional. And that's why they're 90% because the reality is, as we understand psychology, the reason why that first doctor says 90% is because 10% says, F you, I'm going to walk, I'm going to walk fine. And they don't listen to the doctor for the same reason the second doctor said 90% walk by because 10% say, I can't do the rehab. And so they don't have a successful outcome either. But it begins with believing the label or not believing the label that's been assigned to you. And even if you've believed it for years, it, it doesn't matter. The power of this mind, we know so much more. 20 years ago, when your speech center was damaged, you were told you're not going to speak. You, you, we didn't know the brain was elastic. It's called neural plasticity. We now know that it transfers the speech center with the right rehab to another part of the brain. It is not rigid in how it serves its function. We don't always apply that to a PTSD diagnosis. Right. And before you go, we have to talk about Inevitable You. Tell us about Inevitable You before we talk about your book. So it was always important to me, you know, as, a, as an officer, as a, as a servant leader, as, as a guy who had more fun at the NCO club than I did at the officers club, <laughs> I loved loved, loved, loved my soldiers. Um, and they were the greatest thing in many respects that ever happened to me. So translate that through corporate life, translate that through social work, translate that into now I hung my private shingle out back about 2000, 2001. I've been doing this 17, almost 18 years in, in private practice. When I looked around at the really smart men and women that are in my field, you know, whether it's Tony Robbins or T. Harv Eker or some of the older, the Zig Ziglers, all their information is labeled with them. Yeah, I, didn't, I don't need to build me. I, it's not about me. It's about you. It's about your greatness, your potentiality, your inevitability. And I wanted it to survive long after I was gone as a living, breathing, dynamic system. So I trademark the inevitable you. And when I teach, it's not, hey, do this and you'll have what I have. You know, do this tool, use this tool this way, and let's see what you can get for yourself. Because who you are, your power, your potentiality, your greatness, your karma, your destiny, your legacy here, it's yours, you know, and I am here to, you know, light that match, empower that, help you embrace that. It's, uh, it's designed to uh, lift up the high tide so you get the upper end. It's designed to pull along the lower parts of the, the spectrum. You're not broken. Nobody's broken. They're doing the best they can. There are ways to tap into power and potentiality that, that most people literally 
they can see someone else on the upper end of life, be it a sports star, a media star, uh, an explorer, or a scientist. And they don't realize, well, if I do the tool that that person did, then I'll find my fame and fortune wherever that takes me. Right, because I read his book, Inevitable You Live Life by Design. And that's why I was so excited to have him on my show, because there is no way you could read that book and stay the same. Not saying there's anything wrong with you, like he emphasized, but to empower us, even with more power as a human being, he values humanity. And when I read his book, I knew that it was a gift. I'm not getting religious, but it's from God. He wrote it professionally. He wrote it psychologically. And he wrote it spiritually. I don't think, I don't know if he realized he was writing it spiritually, but I know it was some spirit in that book because spirit is the one that changes things, that improves things. It's not just dealing with your mind. This is an amazing book. And it is so powerful, but yet it's so simple. And what I love most about it is he never leaves you alone. <laughs> it was like, I have to just confess, it was like, I couldn't wait to get him on the show because it was like, I felt like a grasshopper waiting, <laughs> waiting to, for my teacher. You're so very kind. Thank you. I'm not exaggerating here. It was like, I had to control myself because he's never going to leave you. When you read his book, he's, he's just not going to leave you. He keep you informed through his um web camps that you still do through your emails. It's like, after you read his book, he, he wants you to stay with him, follow him, continue to be with him because all he wants to do is make sure that you're aware how valuable you are. Yes. And, and I think what gets me the most about it is he's a man with a big heart. Thank you. And he was a soldier. He is a soldier, not was a soldier. He is a soldier. Thank you. And for him to be able to do something like that for humanity, I suggest that you read his book. If you want to see life in a broader scale, a simple scale, a hopeful scale, that's another thing. The things that's going on in the world today, in our government, and people we're supposed to trust, this book will allow you to get beyond this. Because that does not have really anything to do with you in contrast to what you have to do for yourself. And yes. that's all he wants you to know is that you, just like I believe, are a micro in a macro, but make sure your micro is booming. So can I give you two more tools to help yes. make it emphasize a point? Again, yes. this is what you'll experience with me. It's very tools-based. It's it's let's talk metaphorically, then apply it. The first tool is called the Joe Sackick tool. And I don't know how many hockey fans we may have out there, but I picked hockey players because they're very humble. They're, they're very, um, you know, contained. We, we love our heroes that are, you know, not boastful, not prideful, not arrogant. But there's something really to ponder when, when you're trying to absorb this how great am I really message. And so Joe Sackick, Hall of Fame hockey player for the Colorado Avalanche, you know, scores a winning goal in the Stanley Cup, and the microphones are in his face. You know, Joe, tell us about the goal. And he's like, oh, shucks, I, I was skating hard, and my opponent was awesome, and I, I just managed to get the puck on my stick. I threw it in the net, and I was really lucky that it went in. The question I like to ask people to ponder is, do you think that's what he says in the locker room? <laughs> Hmm. You got me on that one. Well, I have clients in the locker room, and he's not boastful, arrogant. He's got a lot of confidence. He is not that way in the locker room. That's a public face. So a lot of times when we're talking about our greatness and people want to be humble because like, oh, I can't claim this or that's really too arrogant of me. No, no, you have to know, is this for public consumption or am I in the locker room? Because being on a Blackhawk heading into a hot LZ, you don't want to be, oh, shucks, let's get lucky, boys. You want to be a confident leader. You want to believe in your power. 
which leads to the second tool. This is called the St. Peter's tool. So I think you'll really love this one. I have this image that, you know, there I am in the line, you know, moving up towards St. Peter when it's all said and done and getting closer. Hey, Joe, come on in. Oh, Linda, awesome. Yeah, hey, 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 Bob, come on in. He's going to get to me and he's going to go, Bill, Bill Sumner, how was it? Did you, did you love it? Because as I tell everybody, I, I didn't build my brain. I, I wasn't in the fetus building my brain. This is a gift. So to pretend I'm not really smart in the locker room when I'm leading people is a disservice to who built me and gave me these gifts. I want to be very grateful and thankful. You want to be very grateful and thankful for your gifts, and you want to live them to the max so you can't deny them. God doesn't make junk. PTSD doesn't create broken junk. It produces a greater strength. Remember, the broken femur is the stronger of the broken versus the unbroken one. So when you start thinking, well, okay, we're excited by Lindy and, and Bill. There are a couple of powerful people. No, 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 no. You are too. You are too. And the more you've been broken, the bigger the rehab and the more strength you have when you can find it. Wow. Wow. That's like, you know, I was saying how you see the glass is always half full. And you said sometimes it is half empty, but live in the half full. It's a trick question. The glass is always both. The real question is, is who are you when you look at the glass? I love that when you said that. And see, that's just one profound thing in the book. Yes, ma'am. Love it. And when you were saying how people fear failure, you said failure is a result of not being so full of fears. It's the fact that you didn't do anything. And a lot of people have that backwards. Yes. Fear is nothing more than adrenaline. And so, again, in my tools, I, I acknowledge sometimes people like, shut up about tools. I don't want to hear tools. But no, <laughs> not your tool. You need to understand how to use it. This is called the eight-foot step ladder, the 800-foot cliff. When I talk about a woman's out in Colorado climbing, free climbing this crazy National Geographic mountain, you know, her adrenaline is working overtime. Now, me, even though I'm a master blaster and I've got a lot of jumps, I never got over my fear of heights. I just did it. So when I get on a step ladder and go to get the last strand of Christmas lights, my adrenaline's running crazy too. In fact, if you were to look at us, the adrenaline's not much difference, but here's the difference. If we could go into her mind and look at the meaning she's creating, it's going to sound something like, I've never been more alive than I am right now. Meanwhile, I'm on the stepladder going, I've never been closer to dying right now. It's adrenaline. So we want to know the tool to take the adrenaline of greatness and realize it's either more life or it's dragging us closer to death. But that's all between the ears. That's not in the reality. And another thing that I found interesting is you also a fire walker teacher. Yes, ma'am. And your daughter walked across the fire? Yes, I got a picture of her waltzing. She actually did a slow waltz. She was nine years old when she did her first fire walk. She's done a bunch. I've done a couple hundred over the years. Very grateful for Tony Robbins' time. That's where I learned my original fire walk training, and I've been doing them on my own now for uh, 12, 14 years. They're uh, an extremely powerful event. So you can so link it to that. that. Um, it's, you know, there was my very first one, like in, gosh, maybe 07 was right before a Mythbusters episode did an episode on fire walking. And they determined it was a myth because there's no scientific reason why your feet don't burn. There's three very simple things that you have to do. It takes five minutes to learn them. I put a whole seminar around it. But what it teaches you is if I can do this, 
and I'm fine. What can I do in my life on Monday morning when I go back to my life? What, what love can I have? What health can I have? What money can I have? What, what, what can I change? Because I now believe in my power. It's awesome. And I tell you another thing that I really love about you too is how you respect your wife. You said she's a very powerful, strong willed woman. And you knew that's the type of woman that you needed to continue to be the man that you were. She has always been, I was lucky to marry up. I know that unequivocally. And if I ever forget it, she reminds me. That's too powerful females in your life. <laughs> yes, yes ma'am. Uh, Y'all are been, walking bomb. That's three bomb people. <laughs> I have been very blessed. As I told yes. you in the beginning, I've been with uh, my clients, my, my students, my mentors. I've, I'm, I didn't do this. This, this happened to me. I just caught, caught a pony and I'm, I'm still riding. Thank you very much. And you have so much, you just have to keep giving. I was um, just so amazed I was able to pull you in for an interview because you are a busy person. And you're, uh, we appreciate you fine. coming on our show today. Thank you. And we are the fourth quarter, so hopefully the Broncos beat the Raiders. I got to <laughs> I gotta go and find out. It's sitting on TiVo. I can't, oh. don't let anybody say anything to me. That's the plus side of the internet. You'll be able to find out. Yes, ma'am. But I got to start where I where I pause it. I don't I don't want to know what it was a tight game. Those pesky oh, Raiders. Wow. Well, thank you for your sacrifice. Oh, thank you for having me. And again, I apologize for our glitch yesterday. You're very very gracious and kind. Thank you very much. And you are on the Truth Will Set You Free show. Give us a memory that you want us to remember about you in truth. Don't. Let anybody label you. Don't let anybody convince you that you have a broken aspect to you. Don't let anybody keep you from your legacy, your destiny. Not everybody will find it. I, I, I'm sad to say some people depart this place in pain. They never found it. But the possibility, the potentiality, the capability, it exists in all of us. There's nothing wrong with you. You are perfect. Just as you are, you are perfectly in the right place. Take this moment to, to really spring even further, higher, faster in your life. Or if you're already doing that, drag somebody along with you. Oh, so if people want to get your book or get in touch with you, how can they get in touch with you? My website is theinevitableyou.com. It's a little bit long. Uh, Linda will probably have it posted with this, but it's T-H-E-I-N-E-V-I-T-A-B-L-E-Y-O-U.com, theinevitableyou.com. And for your book? Uh, it's on the front page of the website. It's the inevitable you live life by design. There's actually four other books that I've written as well. That's the base one that starts the system. I've got a 900 page book on leadership that I finished two and a half years ago. And if you enjoyed the first one, I'll send you the leadership. Book. Oh, definitely. It's just been a blessing to have you on my show. Thanks for Thank your time. Thank you for having me. And for all of you guys out there, post-traumatic stress growth, that's what you got. That's right. And you have a wonderful rest of the evening. Thank you, ma'am. Have a great, great night. And, and all your listeners and viewers and, and readers out there, uh, blessings on you as well. Take care. Have a great evening. You too.